What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the HQ. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to my living room, my apartment. It says, big dogs gotta eat fantasy football, BDGE. I feel like a lot of people still have no idea what that name stands for. It's very confusing. Been a part of my life for a few years, so I actually know what it stands for. But if you don't know what it stands for, it's big dogs gotta eat. I am Nicholas, and I'm here to talk about consistency levels. I'm here to talk about wide receivers and running backs specifically. If you missed last week's episode about quarterbacks and tight ends, I would suggest you go bike and check that out because that was a good one. We broke down the goods, the bads, the floors, the ceilings, the consistent players that you're looking for in your lineup. Listen, floors are great, ceilings are great. This ain't the fucking Sistine Chapel, all right? We need consistency week over week in order to rack up dubs over the season long process that is fantasy football, right? In the off season, we get so wrapped up in, especially around like combine time, if you're playing in dynasty leagues, like we get wrapped up in shit that is so ridiculous, like hand size and, and someone's weight being at 202 instead of 199, 40 time being at 451 instead of 447. I'd do it too. I am absolutely a problem when it comes to that. However, with all these numbers and the overload of it, I feel like sometimes the analytics of fantasy football has become its own industry in itself. I feel like some people that are on Twitter talking about analytics and numbers literally don't even play fantasy football. And that's probably wildly incorrect, but that's like the feeling I've started to get while I start to follow more dynasty and like Devi league players in fantasy football. It's like, do you even play football? At the end of the day, you have a fantasy football team and you need players to be consistent within that team in order to win your league. So yes, it, it's fun to trade in the off season in dynasty. It's fun to profile these prospects and shit, but we're here to talk about the guys that are in the NFL. We're here to talk about the guys that were consistent week in and week out for you. The guys that provided ceilings, the guys that provided floors, the guys that provided everything in between. So the good, the bad, everything in the extra medium middle of it. Consistency, charts, let's fucking go. Real quick before we dive in, as you can see, I got the beautiful new mic. I've had it for a couple episodes since this is an audio thing. I want to shout out some love to the uh, the straight podcast listeners. Obviously, we do our thing on, on video and YouTube will always be my main my main squeeze. And I love you all for watching me. I don't know how you stare at me for 40 minutes, but I really appreciate you for doing so. I think I'm going to do something where I read out one of the reviews that were given to me on my podcast. And if you're looking for it via podcast, you can find it at BDGE, Fantasy Football Everywhere Podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever the fuck, I don't know know where other people listen to it but i promise you were on there this is a uh, a review that came in from money waster listen here bro if you're investing in me, we ain't wasting money, all right? We're helping you win chips. Awesome content quality info from Money Waster. He says, Nick provides quality content information. Just won my first ship based on your Aaron Jones wreck last summer. So many fantasy experts are super boring and dry, but this stuff is interesting. I could listen to more. Always amazing interviews and cool to see you pull back the curtain on the fantasy industry. Keep up the vlogs and fade the public. Thank you, Money Waster. I don't know what your real name is, but I appreciate all the love, the support. If you're watching via video, you know, just a thumbs up or a comment down below gets my dick hard. Let's talk about some players that also have that effect on me when it comes to consistency levels. As I broke down last week, the way we are doing consistency is there are five levels to this shit. First is busty, zero to seven fantasy points. Next is extra medium, seven to 12. Then we have cooking, 12 to 17, booming, 17 to 24. And if you scored over 24 points in a game, you faded the public, you FTP'd that motherfucker. So we're going zero to seven, seven to 12, 12 to 17, 17 to 24, 24 plus, bussy, extra medium, cooking, booming, faded the public. I don't really need to tell you that Michael Thomas kind of ran away with every statistical piece of analysis I could possibly drop down. But what I wanted to really look at were the games where people were just good for you as a fantasy player. So we went from the cooking category, 12 points or more. We took cooking, booming, and faded the public. And we're like, what's the highest percentage of guys who consistently scored in that range? Because those are the guys that like, yes, it's nice to have a ceiling where a guy goes off for 25, but if 45% of his games ended up being a bust or even in the extra medium category, they might not have been that good of a value pick where you ended up picking them. So Michael Thomas ran away with shit, but for who finished behind Michael Thomas in terms of guys who finished in that category three to five, booming, cooking, or faded the public, we have DJ Moore, 
We have Devontae Adams, Chris Godwin, we have Kenny Galladay. Now, I think there are some important things to touch on, especially when it comes to a guy like DJ Moore. Realistically, Moore didn't give us that much of a uh, of a ceiling. Basically, he just lived in the cooking category. Shit, the guy was given terrible quarterback play all year and was so consistent week in and week out. As soon as he found his stride, like he was a legit top 12 wide receiver, even if it was only 13 points, 14 points, 13 points, 14 points, that is a fantastic fucking player to have in your lineup to build your team around. I personally think Cam Newton's going to be back at the helm for Carolina from all the reports and rumors this has been my thought process for months now if you watch any of my offseason stuff so I think Cam's gonna be the quarterback there and listen Cam is let's say not the purest of passers but he's absolutely an upgrade over uh, over Kyle Allen I love Matt Rule coming in as the coach and I love the system that he's going to implement there especially with Brady coming in as the as the OC I really like Carolina this year I think DJ Moore is going to be an absolute fucking problem you pair up the consistency he showed with horrible quarterback play last year combine that with a new ceiling in this offense which I think we will absolutely see in 2020 and DJ Moore again he's going to be a fucking problem Devontae Adams again is going to be a problem in 2020 I mean if you drafted him you were probably not very uh happy about how he performed this year but I'm here to say this the fact that he finishes the number three most consistent wide receiver in terms of those upper level games right the highest percentage of games in which he was either cooking booming or faded the public tells you that when he was on the field he was still very 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 good. The reports of his demise have been greatly exaggerated. He will be a top five fantasy wide receiver next year. Would I get cute and go back to him as, you know, the wide receiver one? Absolutely not over Michael Thomas. Wide receiver two? Probably not. Some are going to be in that like three to five range. That's because we've seen what the Green Bay Packers want to do on offense, right? Their their offense changed dramatically. You've heard me cite this stat already. They went up from 32 and a half percent of their plays being runs last year, not this previous year, but the year before that without LaFleur to this year being over 40% of their plays on the ground. They're throwing to the running backs at a higher rate than they've ever done before. It was like 24% this year compared to 17, 18% the years prior to that. So their game plan has changed. Their offensive scheme has changed a little bit. So I think that hurts the ceiling that we could have for Devontae Adams. But in terms of like the floor and the consistency, still an elite wide receiver one. I just don't know if he has that wide receiver one overall upside like some other guys in the top five do. So it was Michael Thomas, DJ Moore, Devontae Adams, Chris Godwin, Kenny Galladay in the top five. What I really want to hone in on here is number six, who was the number six most consistent guy in terms of scoring his games in the cooking, booming, or faded the public category. A sort of forgotten name here, and I think he's going to be an absolute fucking value in 2020 fantasy drafts. That's my boy Calvin Ridley down in Atlanta. Calvin Ridley cooked up or better, in 62% of his games. Most people are going to forget about Ridley and what he actually did when he was on the field last year because he did end up getting hurt, and you might remember some of the bust games because when this dude fucking busts, it's like he hasn't ejaculated in, in weeks, right? And he lets it all go out there and throws up like a one-point dud. And he did it during his rookie year too. So the ceiling and the floor discrepancy is definitely what sticks in people's minds. But Ridley was very, very good for you when he was on the field, especially once Mohamed Sanu left. So I want to I wanna rattle out some big facts for y'all. Following Mohamed Sanu's departure to New England, Ridley played in six games before he ended up getting hurt and missing the rest of the season. In those six games, he averaged 14.6 half PPR fantasy points per game in those six games. So it is a smaller sample size, of course, but 14.6 is no joke. He averaged 8.2 targets a game, 5.7 receptions, and 82.2 receiving yards, scored in three of six games, was under 70 receiving yards in one of those six games. I think we're getting a big dog discount on Calvin Ridley when we go into 2020 drafts. Maybe not even a discount. What I think might end up happening is a lot of the analysis that went into him sophomore year, we're going to get a lot of it going into his junior year, his third year here. We're going to get him around the same price that we did last year, which was like mid fifth round, almost borderline sixth round pick, which in my eyes would be a discount. If he's going the exact same place he did last year while he improved upon his season in terms of efficiency, points per game, and getting to know the offense a little bit more, it'll be the second year coming into Dirk Cutter's offense. If he's at the same price he was last year, then he will be a discount. Talking about Dirk Cutter, like Dirk Cutter came in and he has a wide, wide history going back to the Falcons 2012, 2014 in Tampa Bay for all those years in between, and then back to the Falcons. His offense is always, always, always ranked in the top five in terms of passing rate. So the passing plays are not coming down in terms of volume anytime soon. That's fantastic news if you own any shares of this Atlanta offense. And I just checked right before we did this, the uh, ADP right now of where Calvin Ridley is going in FFPC and MFL, which is their best ball drafts, but they give you a good idea of about where guys are going. He's going in the 60s. So he's in like the lower 60s, pick 60 to 65, which I think is phenomenal fucking value for Calvin Ridley based on what we saw. The personnel will dictate my outlook 
for Calvin Ridley going into next year, my, the personnel in terms of what the Atlanta Falcons do, because we don't know what's going to happen with Austin Hooper. They just said they're going to let him test for agency. I would not be surprised if we ended up with Hooper back on our team because he was so young. He was so good for us last year. He had his breakout. I don't know why we would let a key piece of our passing offense walk, but Austin Hooper might be gone. Muhammad Tanu was obviously gone. We are absolutely a big time candidate to land one of these like veteran slot wide receivers, I think, and kind of just plug and play and see what we can get out of them for a year or two. Maybe like Emmanuel Sanders or like a Randall Cobb or someone in that zone where they're coming off of a free agency summer and we kind of just need to plug and play and hope that they could give us a little bit something left in the tank. But if we're assuming that we don't make a giant splash in free agency or we don't use one of our day one or day two picks on a wide receiver, then Ridley should see a great fucking increase in value going into next year. Some other wide receivers just to point out from a pure bust standpoint, Julio Jones busted in one game, 7% of his games, Devontae Parker in two of 16. So 13%, same with John Brown. So John Brown, Devontae Parker provided fantastic floors. The problem with a guy like John Brown is that he had eight extra medium games. So while you're like, he was never bad, you still are not really looking for like eight and a half, nine points out of your receivers. So I would like to see more of a ceiling. I would think that Buffalo is going to add another piece to this wide receiver group for Josh Allen to kind of work with. Probably someone that's pretty high up in this wide receiver class, but there's tons of good wide receivers in this class. Even if they got someone on day two or round two, round three or whatever, still going to probably be an integral piece of this passing offense. So John Brown, consistency in terms of not having a lot of bust games is nice to see, but Devontae Parker, two busty games, and then the kid balled out. I don't really need to tell you about what Devonta Parker did in his fifth year breakout, which is ridiculous. Julio Jones, the reason why you weren't really excited is because, yes, he only had one bus game. But when you draft a guy like Julio Jones, and a lot of people probably use their first round pick on him, you're hoping for like that FTP number to hit around four. You want at least like 25% of the games to be weak winning games, which he didn't really give you. And then if we flip things a little bit, we could talk about the bad. Busty, who busted in the highest percentage of games. Now, these weren't the overall highest percentage of games because there's a lot of just like shit wide receivers that you wouldn't expect to perform in fantasy anyways. But Corey Davis, 12 of 15 games he busted in 80%. Uh, I think it's just time to, to give up on Corey Davis. The one takeaway I would say with Davis is like, yes, he had everything coming out. He had the production. He had the film guys liked him. He had the high draft capital. But coming out of a small school is always a warning flag for me. So when we talk about like breakout age and dominating at the college level in terms of production, I still want to see him do that in a power five conference. So that makes me a little bit nervous just going forward. Hopefully we can learn some things from the consistency charts. James Washington was a guy I was never really high on. I think people are probably going to get a excited because he kind of exploded over the second half of the year but this Pittsburgh offense is going to be completely different coming into this year with getting Big Ben back hopefully I'd like to see that Pittsburgh offense run again like we had seen in previous years because I love Deontay Johnson so James Washington busted in 10 to 15 why people will be very high on him is because he boomed in, in three of the 15 games so you like to see that ceiling whereas three booming games is as many as Julio Jones it's as many as Demonte Parker it's three times as many as Corey Davis it is three billion times as many as Brandon Cooks because the kid did not fade the public or boom in any of his games he busted in nine of 14 what can I say about Brandon Cooks other than I was wrong as fuck I really don't know I don't really know how to explain it I mean they use more two tight end sets he got the concussion it was Robert Woods it was Cooper Cup the offensive line obviously took a monster step back losing some of the pieces this offseason which led to Jared Goff being under pressure more and we know Jared Goff under pressure is an uglier sight than snacks crying so if they don't shore up the offensive line this could be another problem for Brandon Cooks who's a guy who kind of thrives on his deeper speed and uh, they weren't able to connect too often it was it was all underneath to Cooks and Higby and, and Robert Woods so Cooks is uh, an interesting study we'll see what happens with him I also I want to touch on two other guys that I think get a lot of steam like I see especially Jarvis Landry on Twitter I've been seeing so much love for Jarvis Landry just like his his year over year finishes and I I respect the consistency but again he has the same thing with John Brown like he busted in three games he was extra medium in seven games he wasn't consistently giving you like really useful games so like at best he was more often than not your wide receiver three on a good day but seven out of the 16 games were in the seven to 12 point range so those guys are good to have but listen just because we're looking at like end of season finishes and the guy stays on the field and he puts up nine points a game doesn't mean that you want to jump up in value for these guys doesn't mean you want to draft them around earlier because again looking at consistency is a big teller for how to build your team in a sense I would say like these guys are important but not if you're not if you're like oh Jarvis Landry has been you know top 18 wide receiver for four years running but when you look at it like realistically on a week over week basis he's not he's not someone you want to have as you, as the wide receiver 18 overall in the draft he's not someone you want to depend on as the wide receiver two on your team more often than not he's giving you wide receiver three numbers so the overall end of season numbers are nice but the week in and week out consistency that he gives you at a lower level is not really something worth reaching for so it's not a guy i'm staying away from by any means but again we year over year he's never been a guy that i i love grabbing and i can't say like even the guys that probably owned him this year i don't think you were that excited 
but it was nice. He definitely had some good games, and you were like, wow, he performed better than OBJ, so this is really, really nice. But buying them after the fact that the, he's kind of on the upswing is never a good idea with these guys who don't really consistently produce at a high level. So that was pretty much a, a real quick deep dive, if that makes sense, into the wide receiver consistency. And again, if you guys already have the Big Dogs Draft Guide, then you could head right over to bigdogsdraftguide.com. And once you sign in, you'll have access to these consistency charts. The main menu under tools, consistency charts, you could see it for quarterback, wide receiver, running back, tight end. I just, I just want to give you some things that stuck out to me. So bigdogsdraftguide.com. Also, another big announcement. We have actually partnered with Monkey Knife Fight. They are sponsoring our draft guide this year. We have not finalized all the details and the exact process for it, but it's going to be fucking amazing because you guys are literally going to be able to pay $10 and get the Rookie Dynasty Guide, the Season Long Guide, as as well as $20 to play with on Monkey Knife Fight. So you're getting $70 for $10, including the draft guide for free. That is going to be coming within the next week. So I'd almost want to tell you, don't buy it right now. If you are in one of the... 35 states that has monkey knife fight allowed to play on you can go check that out on monkeyknifefight.com i would wait on it because you'll be able to get all these packages for literally 10 bucks as soon as this deal finalizes it's a ridiculous it's a great value for me it's a great value for you guys more people get to see the hard work that we put into it for a much lower price so last year like the kit packet the rookie dynasty plus the season long by midsummer i was selling it for like 50 dollars, and i mean i don't apparently a lot of people bought it so the market said it was worth the money but i'm i'm super fucking excited that i get to offer it to you guys for literally 10 bucks so the people that are in college that are a little strapped for cash this is a perfect deal for you guys so shout out to monkey knife fight stay tuned for more details on that deal let's move over to the running back position and again if you're enjoying the video just make sure you hit that thumbs up drop a comment if you have any questions about like specific players consistency numbers i'll answer you in the comments i'll give you uh whatever numbers i have on the sheets here but again if you already have access to the guide then you can go check that out on bigdogdraftguide.com Let's talk running back. Sorry, I got all my charts and crazy shits in front of me. So very similar to Michael Thomas, Christian McCaffrey was the consistency god. He faded the public in nine of the 16 games he played in. But just a general talk about the running backs. They have a higher, the, the better, you know, the top tier guys, running backs, not even like the elite guys, any of the, like the RB ones just tend to have a much higher floor than the wide receiver ones. And this is a year over year thing, right? So I'm looking at it. Michael Thomas and Julio were the only wide receivers in fantasy football last year that had one bus game or fewer. So both of them had one bus game, and that was the best rate of all the wide receivers in the NFL last year. Among running backs, you're looking at the same kind of floor consistency. Zeke and Fournette both didn't bust in a single game. And again, bust is 0-7, to seven, then 7-12, seven to 12-17, 17-24, 24, 24 plus. So Zeke and Fournette both did not bust in a single game, and there were eight total running backs that busted once or fewer. So Michael Thomas and Julio, the only ones to bust once or fewer, there were eight different running backs. And that's kind of just common sense and makes sense when you think about starting running backs, right? They get like an average of minimal like 12 to 15 touches a game, so it's really not that hard to rack up seven fantasy points. But just on an overall floor basis, I thought it was a, a good note to kind of throw out there to you guys. So Christian McCaffrey, the unquestioned consistency god. But Dalvin Cook, man, Dalvin Cook was not not far off in terms of like the advantage he gave your team. Christian McCaffrey was either booming or fade the public in 14 of 16 games. It was just an unprecedented fantasy year. Like if you had Christian McCaffrey and you didn't make the playoffs, you should question your ability to survive as a human being. Dalvin Cook, on the other hand, though, six games where he faded the public. In terms of games from cooking up to faded the public, right? This is what I did with the wide receivers. I wanted to see the running backs that gave you the highest percentage of their games in that three to five category range. He was there 13 of the 14 games he played in. So basically the same rate as Christian McCaffrey. In that three to five range, he was there. Obviously, McCaffrey gave you a higher week-to-week -week ceiling. But don't forget how fucking good Dalvin Cook was when he was in your lineup. I think he has a legit argument to be the RB2 next year along with Saquon Barkley right Saquon Barkley obviously dealt with the high ankle sprain most of the year and that plummeted his statistics we don't know what he would have performed like had he not suffered the injury but I really think there's an argument to be made for Dalvin Cook versus Saquon Barkley next year as the RB2 as the 102 Aaron Jones who finished as the RB2 on the year was a little bit all over the place and this should not come as a surprise to anyone that owned him he busted four times so among running backs that finished in the top 12 Aaron Jones busted the most. His 25% bust rate was a little bit concerning. He was very touchdown dependent. So in games where he did not score a touchdown, there were some games he ran for like 55 yards and didn't score a touchdown. So that became an issue. Splitting time with Jamal Williams, that became an issue. But at the same time, he cooked up in four of his games. He boomed in two of his games and he faded the public in five. So among all running backs, McCaffrey faded the public in nine, Dalvin Cook in six, Aaron Jones and Derrick Henry tied for third with five games. So he absolutely gave you that those ceiling games. He gave you 
ceilings arguably unlike any other running backs. Like he was giving you some games where he was at like 38, 40 plus points, and you love that in a running back. I am concerned again going into next year. It just seems like one of those like Philadelphia Eagles situations where unless there's an injury to another running back, the offensive system is just built not to use one running back. So Aaron Jones, fantastic player to have on your team. Overall RB2 finish on the year just in terms of pure points. But where you're going to have to draft him next year is going to be a little bit concerning. Like I will not use my first round pick on Aaron Jones because I know that he's going to be playing 55 to 60 percent of the snaps even in his elite breakout like unquestioned dominant year this year he's still only playing on 60 percent of the snaps so that being said we already know what this offensive system is going to do to Aaron Jones's playing time ceiling is great the floor is not so great we'll probably get a mix of these types of games again next year so in terms of top 12 pick I'd probably rather have a little bit more consistency speaking of consistency there were a couple guys that were consistently fucking terrible David Montgomery with the workload he has the workload he had for him to have busted in seven of 16 games is really 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 not good for business that was nearly half his games he busted in and no one near that percentage had anywhere near the touches that he had and to top that off four of his games were extra medium so 11 of the 16 games he had nearly 70 percent of his games were at 12 points or fewer for a starting running back to get the volume that he got and to score under 12 points is a fucking catastrophe now do i think david montgomery is a bust he might be but i'm not declaring him a bust like he ended up listen he was a rookie he went over a thousand yards from scrimmage he scored at what was it like seven touchdowns or something this was a really bad offense their offensive line took a major step back Mr. Trubisky was terrible this year for the majority of the year so he didn't necessarily surround himself in a situation where he's going to excel had he been on a better team David Montgomery might have fucking balled out this year you know an extra 200 300 total yards from scrimmage is not out of the question on a better team with a better offensive line so what we saw watching him Yes, there was definitely some stuff left to be desired there. We knew coming in, he didn't have a lot of burst, man. And that was a problem. He didn't really break off any big runs. He had trouble getting through the line because they they didn't make any holes for him. So he was not able to create much on his own outside of, you know, making one guy miss in the backfield. And if you don't have the burst at the NFL level, that's going to be a problem when you don't have big holes. He didn't fade the public in any of his games. So it was just a bad season all around. A couple other guys I want to touch on real quick, like James White. A lot of people like James White. They're like, oh, he's so consistent. But 12 of the 15 games, so 80% of his games he was either in section one or two he busted in three games extra medium in nine games so yes he's another guy where people love to have him as like a staple of your lineup but he's a flex play at best man he doesn't not he really does not give you any type of ceiling faded the public in one game zero booming games two cooking games so the majority of the time he was living in that one to two section where he was either busting for you or he was giving you an extra medium performance extra medium performances make you finish with an extra medium fucking record and that's not what we want in fantasy football we want the top we want to fade the public people so James White again he was like a pretty popular fifth sixth round pick going into the year because people are so consistent he's part of the game plan like yes but if you're gonna buy him coming off of his best year that's not the time to do so now I'm gonna put up some numbers here I'm gonna put up two players next to each other and I'm curious as to who you guys think this is the running back on the top finished RB 17 overall only played in 13 games the running back on the bottom RB 34 only played in 11 games the running back on the top was either busty or extra medium in 53 percent of his games the running back on the bottom same thing but 54 percent in terms of the ceiling they were close to each other too this is Josh Jacobs and Damian Williams so I mentioned this in the top 10 lessons learned video two weeks ago Josh Jacobs, again, was more of a, a floor play than a ceiling play. He did not give you too many boom games. And it was because of the lack of work in the receiving game. I'm totally open to Josh Jacobs being more involved in the receiving game. I think he should be. He's a good receiver, but we don't know if that's going to happen. They did re-sign Jalen Richard, which is a red flag already. They did come out and say at the combine, though, Mike Mayock came out and said that the next step for Josh Jacobs' evolution is to get him much more involved in the receiving game. So those are the things I'd like to hear. If we hear all offseason from beat reporters, from training camp, from players, from Josh Jacobs, about how he's being more and more and more involved in the receiving game, I will be okay with Josh Jacobs as an early, early pick. But until we hear that stuff, I'm not okay with it because the floor he gives you is straight rushing stuff. And those are not the running backs I like to pick, especially not in the early rounds. The other guy is Damian Williams. Damian Williams gave you identical numbers to Josh Jacobs. And that's why a lot of his games came off of like multi-week injuries. And I did a study like two years ago, or it might've been last season, where I looked at running backs coming off of multi-week injuries. Their first game back is always a large percentage of snaps, carries, receptions, and targets off of their normal seasonal average. So the season season average that they ended with per game when they come back from a multi-week injury say they missed weeks two three four whatever happened in week five went into that study and it was always like 25 percent less so even if they're eventually going to be worked back into that workhorse role the stats in those games 
hurt their overall season stats. And I think that's what we saw from Damian Williams. Because we saw him ball out in the playoffs, and we saw him ball out when he was healthy on the field next year. So I really like, and this I don't know if this is a mistake to me, but if Damian Williams drops as a value in redraft leagues next year, I'm not going to be picking him in the second or third round. It's going to depend on what the Chiefs do in the draft. Wouldn't be surprised if they didn't take another running back until like the fifth or sixth round. And if Damian Williams goes into the year, into the summer as a starter... I would love him in the fourth, fifth round going into next year because we've seen what he can do when he's when he's healthy. Now, the question I had with Damian Williams, which came to fruition this year, ironically, is nearly the same exact thing that cautions me with Josh Jacobs, right? Josh Jacobs, the reason I didn't like him wasn't because I loved him on film. He's a great running back on film. He's good in the passing game. He's fluid, all parts of the field. He's powerful. He's tough. He can make guys miss. My problem was that we never saw him handle a big workload at college. So what makes me think we could do it in the NFL? My problem with Damian Williams was, again, not the player. He is a size speed specimen, not the athlete, not what he can do in this Chiefs offense, but we've also never seen him do it over the full season at an NFL level. So I have the same problem with both of these guys, not from a consistency level, but a durability level. Like, you got to prove that shit to me that you could do it over the full course of the season. Is it Josh Jacobs' fault he was never given the full workload at Alabama? No, it was Nick, Nick Saban decided to do whatever the fuck he wanted to do, but that doesn't mean I need to know whether or not he could do it. Like, I'm looking at the numbers that are given to me the same way that Josh Jacobs is doing with the carries that are given to him whatever he could do at his best I'm putting the numbers into context the best that I can for y'all when we look at durability when we look at Damian Williams Josh Jacobs their seasons were not different whatsoever so if we're gonna get a fucking three round discount on these two running backs who give you nearly identical week over week numbers and I would say Damian Williams has a much higher ceiling in that Kansas City offense like listen I'm just here to drop the big facts and get the big mad comments down in the comment section from y'all when I hate on Josh Jacobs I'm not hating on Josh Jacobs I just need more in the receiving game who else do we got here that we could look at Kenyon Drake faded the public in 21 percent of his games man I I'm very intrigued to see what happens in Arizona there all the talk is that they're going to keep David Johnson it would be a big cap hit and I don't want to start getting down ran, random rabbit holes but like listen he was so fucking washed up the dude was like he's put through a laundry detergent he's put through a dishwasher what more do you need to see from David Johnson to know that he ain't it anymore like how are you going to be the Arizona Cardinals fucking franchise and Watch what Kenyon Drake did last year for you and then be like, yeah, but we still think we want to get David Johnson involved. Like, listen, I know it's a big cap cut, but you can either leave him on your team, waste a roster spot and $16 million, or you can cut his ass, open up a roster spot and waste $14 million. So you're actually saving $2 million in the process, knowing that Kenyon Drake is a much better fucking running back than David Johnson is right now. Kenyon Drake, give him the keys. Probably ain't going to happen. I don't even know why I'm yelling about him. Also, Leonard Fournette sucks. Seven of his 15 games last year were extra medium. All right? He actually never busted. Zero busts. Him and Zeke, zero busts. But seven extra medium games. Nine points. Ten points. Nine points. Eight points. Eleven points. Get the fuck off my team, Leonard Fournette. That is it. I'll get the fuck off your screen. I'm sorry for yelling at you guys. You know I got nothing but love for you. If you are listening via podcast, a rating and review would be very, very much appreciated. Maybe I will read your review on next week's episode, which I believe will be possibly the coaching changes. If I got to do some research and see if we have everybody in spot. If you're on YouTube, a thumbs up would be much appreciated. If you enjoyed the video, if you found it informational and or valuable because you definitely didn't find it entertaining so we're gonna have to stick with the first two value props drop a comment down below what you think of the consistency charts again you can find them on bigdogdraftguide.com i love y'all and i am out till next thursday's video